When we say the Apostles' Creed together, we talk about how Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. And then we also say, He descended to hell. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Mark 15. Mark 15, starting at, starting at uh, 33. It says, At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried on a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw saw how he died, He said, surely this man was the Son of God. That's where we'll stop. Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He descended to hell, as we profess in the creed that summarizes our Christian faith. If you look at this passage here, It says in verse 33, at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sixth hour is noon. They start at six in the morning. So that's the that's the first hour of the day. And so the sixth hour would be noon, and then the ninth hour would be about three o'clock. And so from noon to three, it was dark. And it may have been an eclipse or something. There's different ideas about what that may have been, but but uh, it, was, it was dark. And that darkness parallels the absolute rejection of God. It wasn't just a coincidence that that darkness came right at that moment. If you consider what darkness is and what it symbolizes and represents, if you think about the first thing that was created by God, it was light. That was the first thing. And God separated light from darkness And so darkness kind of symbolizes a a chaos, an absence of of order. And throughout the Bible, darkness just represents everything that's wrong with the world. And when Jesus was arrested in, in Luke's gospel, he says to them, this is your hour when darkness reigns. And so here we have the darkness coming and coming at midday. When it's supposed to be light out, darkness comes. And then verse 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus there is quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. And uh, that's your Bible reading track for today. Um, it, this must have been a bone-chilling cry for both Mark and Matthew to record Jesus' original words here. He doesn't just say, and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He puts, they put it in there in Aramaic, which would have been Jesus' original language. And when I looked at this, this text here, it doesn't, it's not just a carbon copy of of the Old Testament passage, it's, it's right out of the Aramaic, which means that this was recorded as Jesus said it. This must have been burned into Mark's brain to have him put it there as that. And you notice that after Jesus said this, there's some people who are saying, well, look, he's calling Elijah. It must have been a really labored labored statement that Jesus made. Eloi, Eloi. They probably thought, he probably was saying it in such a, uh, an awful way that, that maybe they thought, is he, is he saying Elijah? 
he was probably in agony on the cross and his words probably didn't come out quite clearly for obvious reasons. In ways we cannot understand, Jesus was utterly forsaken by God the Father. Utterly forsaken. Now we go through difficult times for sure. We've all had difficult moments and awful times and times when we've felt like maybe God has forsaken us. David, for example, he felt forsaken when he wrote Psalm 22. And another one who's maybe an obvious example is Job. If you read through the book of Job, there's one verse here. If only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. There's times when we feel that way too. And we have good reason to feel that way even. There, There are little hells that we might go through on earth, but only Jesus experienced actual hell. We might go through times that might feel like hell or something that's just terribly awful to the point where we might feel like saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we can't even begin to understand what it's like to be actually, utterly, completely forsaken by God. Because even in our worst of times, we can still know that God is with us. But for Jesus, being on the cross, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree, in the darkness at midday, Jesus descended into hell. Look at uh, the screen here with me if you would. Why does the Apostles' Creed add, he descended to hell? To assure me in times of personal crisis and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul, especially on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. If you look at Jesus on the cross, for the beginning part, In Luke it says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And in John it says he sees his mother, Mary, and he says he sees the disciple that he loves there, and he says, um, well, he essentially says, would you take my mother into your house? Be responsible for her, because as Jesus, the oldest son, it was his responsibility to care for his mother. And so John, that disciple... Um, He took Mary into his house. But so at the beginning when Jesus was put on the cross, there's a bit of a different character in his words. He's still, he's caring for other people even from the cross. But at the end, at the end, it's really anguished and painful. So now we're saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the only time when Jesus really says, My God, usually when he's talking to his father, he calls him father. But in this case, he says, my God. Kind of symbolizes a brokenness there. Jesus, father, son, and and spirit, they were one in, in some mystical, heavenly way that we can't understand. And... He always called him Father. But here on the cross, where that is broken, when Jesus is utterly forsaken by God, he still says, my God. He hasn't lost his faith or anything, but there's a brokenness there. My God, why have you forsaken me? And you notice that Mark says in verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathes his last. Usually when you die on a cross, you die from exhaustion. And so you just slowly lose strength. But not in Jesus' case. He dies with a loud cry. We can't imagine 
what kind of agony that was. I mean, even aside from the physical agony of being on the cross, the spiritual, as it says, unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul, his entire being, he descended to hell. Hell is less of a place and more receiving the full justice of sin. We, we think of hell as a place, and the Bible does speak of hell as a place. It talks about the lake of fire, Gehenna, and so forth. Uh, but more often, the Bible talks about how God is a just God, and sin is going to be punished. It's going to, get, it's going to be annihilated. God's going to take care of this. And we need to be away from that. That's why Christ saved us from it. So Jesus, he wasn't in the location of hell as we would speak of it, but he suffered the torments of hell. He suffered the full justice for our sin. And there's, there's people, it's, it's easy maybe even for us sometimes to think, well, maybe hell just sounds mean. And I don't want to think of God as being a mean God. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe, it's, not, maybe it's not that bad. I mean, there's, there's some people who say that. Maybe it's even easy for us to say that. But that really comes from a human view of sin. We like to think of our sins as just little mistakes. You know, like spilled milk. No big deal. We're inclined to, to minimize sin, but in reality, it's catastrophic. Our sin is huge in ways we can't understand. And it's easy to become immune to sin and even get defensive about it. It's easy to, for example, uh, one thing I I catch myself doing sometimes is is I I can be kind of bitter about things. And I can have kind of this all or nothing attitude. And sometimes it's easy for me to just kind of hang on to that and say, well, I have a right to be bitter about that. And And I... and I have to actually consciously be, become aware of that and be like, well, wait a minute. No, that's not the right attitude to have. But unless I'm thinking about it and there's some sort of light shine on it, I'm going to hang on to that. That's really easy to do. Or another verse, Proverbs 30, 20, it says, This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. It's really easy for us to just become immune to what we do and to think, eh, no big deal. But in reality, and this is where we need the Bible to teach us and tell us the way it really is, because in our own minds, we just live with this delusion that, eh, sin is just like spilled milk. Nothing to cry about. But in reality, sin is outright rejection of God and open rebellion against His perfect justice. If you think about what Christ went through on that cross, that is what sin really is. One of the functions of the cross is to show us how bad our sin really is. This is not spilled milk here. This is open rejection and defiance of the one true holy God. And make no mistake, hell is real because God is holy. God is not going to just look the other way for sin. This needs to be taken care of. This needs to be gotten rid of. One way I think of it, and it's really unpleasant to think of it this way, but would you want human waste at your dinner table? Absolutely not. That's gross. That's disgusting. Wouldn't, how could you even picture that? That's the way sin is. It's unacceptable. It needs to be gotten rid of. It needs to be flushed down the toilet. We can't just pretend it's okay. God is a holy God. And Jesus had to take the full punishment of our sin, which means hell. 
In fact, if Jesus did not descend to hell, we are still in our sins. We will have to meet him halfway. Because if he didn't descend into hell, then he didn't fully pay for our sins. Maybe he partially paid for them. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It says that we are saved from our sins by Christ's blood on the cross. He descended to hell. He paid for our sins completely. Not sort of, not most of the way, all the way. That means he descended to hell. He experienced the full judgment of sin. Galatians 3.13, this is in your Bible reading tracks this week too. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So Jesus was cursed. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He was cursed. He was damned for us. Verse 39. Can't read this passage without zeroing in on this verse here. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. This is the climax of the Gospel of Mark. This is the point where it's like the biggest wow here. Because of what just happened, he saw how he died, and now he says, Okay, this man was the Son of God. The most unlikely pagan declares Jesus to be the Son of God. This is probably the guy who was in charge of killing Jesus and crucifying him. He was the centurion that was stationed there. He probably wasn't just there watching for fun. Crucifixions are very unpleasant tasks. So the guy responsible for putting him on the cross says, no, he's the Son of God. And if you look at the text there, right by son, there's a small letter B, and at the bottom there's a text note. It says, or a son. This guy hadn't had his catechism yet. He didn't really know that there was only one Son of God or that there was a a triune God or anything like that. But he saw what happened and It clicks with him. He realizes this guy was for real. Okay, what Jesus' descent to hell means for us, some things for us to consider. The cross shows us the gravity of sin as well as how loving and just our God is. So, one thing, God loves us. Jesus literally went through hell for us. You have to really love somebody to literally go through hell for them. None of us would have been able to survive that. So, Jesus loves us and God loves us. God the Father. And sometimes there's this expression, you know, going through hell or went through hell, that kind of thing. That might be just an expression for everybody else. But in this case, this is for real. Jesus actually went through hell so that we wouldn't have to. That doesn't mean we're not going to have some problems or difficulties. There might, not be, there might be times when we might want to say, my God, why have you forsaken me? That might happen. But we are never going to have to say those words in the ways that Jesus said them. Because God loves us. And another thing for us to consider, our sin must be terrible beyond comprehension if this is what it takes to pay for it. If this is what Jesus had to go through, then our sin must be beyond what we can understand. It must be awful. When, um, and obviously not all of you would be up for this, and that's totally understandable, But uh, in watching The Passion of the Christ, that was probably the only movie I've cried at in my adult life. And it was because, and all I was seeing is just the physical aspects of Jesus' suffering. But what it represents is all of his spiritual suffering also. And I couldn't help but think, this is my sin and this is his love. 
This is how big my sin is, and this is how big his love is. And I burst into tears. And the entire time, I'm just watching all this awful stuff. This is how, this is how big my sin is. This is how big his love is. At this last part of this passage, when the centurion says, okay, he really was the son of God. Jesus descended to hell so that we would proclaim him son of God. So not just the centurion, this is supposed to be us too. When we think about what Jesus went through for us, we're supposed to say he really was the son of God. And yes, we as his followers will go through little hells so the same re- for the same reason, so that more people would call him son of God. Now when we go through our difficult times, it's easy to seek sympathy or to feel sorry for ourselves or to play the victim, that kind of thing. That's, that's easy to do. And I'm not exempt from that either. But the ultimate reason for us going through our little hells is so that more people would say, Jesus really is the Son of God. That's why we go through our difficult times. Let's pray together. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you sent Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we're thankful that you went to the cross willingly. We pray, O Lord, that we would never forget the gravity of your sacrifice and how amazing your love is, as well as how awful our sin is. We pray that that would change us, Lord, that we would continue to to wonder and marvel at you, and that we would continue to put off our sinful nature, all so that we and others would more and more say that you truly are the Son of God. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.